Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Zoom on the Fly. This is not much of a tying program tonight. It's more about getting started in doing tying programs. And tonight, we're going to be using a laptop. I'm Al Beattie from Boise, Idaho. And tonight, my wife is um, working on something else, and I'll be running this by myself. So I'm going to ask two people to give me a hand here, Fred Dupre and Jim Ferguson. Now, here's a couple of things that I, I want to make sure that I don't forget to talk about. And so, Fred and Jim, just remind me to do the um, fly display. And then you can remind me of that if I don't remember to do it after we've done most of the program. Anyway, tonight we're talking about using that thing right there that I'm pointing at, the laptop, as our tool for, for making our presentation. And I want to give a shout out to John Strand from Oslo, Norway. He's the one that, whether he knew it or not, gave me the idea. And I took his, his idea and ran with it from there to use it as this tool. And the other thing I need to uh, make sure that you remind me, guys, is option two for this plan. So at the end of the program, we're going to want to talk about the fly display and option two. So don't let me forget that because Gretchen isn't here to help me keep my brain on. Anyway, getting started tonight, let's start with a look at my Zoom setup. What we have here is, you can see a camera setting in front of me there, a green screen. There's a fly in the camera's screen. You can see on the computer next to me that there's a fly there. And then there's another monitor in the background with that same fly, a couple of lights. And in fact, lights are a very, very important thing. And I want you to understand that when I'm saying they're important, this fly tying room, if you will, was a bedroom that had one light in it like a lot of bedrooms do. And when we decided to make a fly tying room out of it, I installed track lighting, all of uh, the tracks connecting back to that main light in the room so that I could add four more lights along with the one in the ceiling. So I got five lights there and a total of other lights scattered around the room, scattered around the room here. I've got anyway, I got a total of 16 lights in here. So when we talk about putting some light on the subject, uh, you know that I'm pretty serious about it. And uh, if you think you're gonna be able to run a program with even a laptop like that guy right there, if you think you can run the program with the laptop, with your fly tie in light and the light in the room, you're gonna be very disappointed. So we'll set that aside. We'll get more into the, into the lighting here in a moment. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're going to cover in the next three weeks. This week, we're talking about using a laptop. And next week, we'll talk about using uh, adding a cell phone, either as the main source of the presentation or as a second camera. It'll, and we'll be doing both. On the third week, ask Fred to tell us about, tell us about what you're going to do on week three. Well, in week three, we're going to uh, look at the possibility of using uh, webcams. And I started this some time ago, a uh, couple of years ago, buying webcams. Today, they're pretty cheap. They're about $35 a piece. And uh, we're going to use webcams to uh, tie some flies. So, And I might add that Fred calls this Tying flies on the cheap or something like that. Making that is correct. Yeah, so, but he'll tell you more about that when the next week comes around. One of the things that um, we'll run into that we're not talking about in, in the first two weeks anyway, I'm sure Fred will probably touch on it somewhat, but we're not going to be getting into the audio part other than what you get out of your, um, your laptop or your cell phone or both. Okay, just, just so... We know where we're headed. We're working on some things that are there tonight that are really, really important. And that is the thing that frustrates so many people trying to get into tying flies over Zoom is cameras that focus on places where they don't want it. And they wear a they wear a t-shirt. It should be a good background, shouldn't it? And they can't see the fly. And it's uh, things don't work out real well for them. So we're going to talk about making these two automatic things work for you 
rather than against you. And I'll guarantee you that automatic focus will focus in the wrong direction every single time if you give it a chance. Now, Fred's going to show you how to beat the automatic focus in another way, but for now, we're going to be making it work for us. So I'm going to turn around to my full wide view camera, and we're going to talk about automatic focus. In fact, I'm just going to start working my way over towards that camera, and you can see as I get closer, that thing keeps refocusing, and as I get closer and closer, it gets more and more focused until you can see my shirt. In fact, I've got a fly here. I'm going to hold this fly up, and you know what? That fly, no matter what, if I bring it right back by my shirt, it's well in focus, but you can't see the darn thing. It's too small. If I bring it up to the camera, well, you can see it, but it's, it's out of focus and, and my shirt is still in focus. Well, that's the automatic focus working against us. And why is that working against us? Well, let me go back here and we'll talk about it. Well, in fact, you can see it right there, the green, uh fire uh, corkboard behind the camera that you see right here doesn't have any texture my shirt has texture and it causes the camera to focus and there's a lot more texture in the picture when i do this there's a lot more texture in in my shirt than there is in that little bitty fly and so the camera is going to pick a, pick the easiest thing it can and that's the thing with texture so when you background is the most important thing you can deal with in both exposure, that's light and dark, and in, in the automatic focus. And with that in mind, I am going to go into a PowerPoint. We're just going to go over just a couple of things before we get into the actual demonstration that we're going to do a little bit later tonight. Tonight, obviously, our PowerPoint is about demonstrating the fly with Zoom. And we're just going to move to the next slide. The important bit of information is your broadband speed. You're not making any kind of a presentation if you've got lousy broadband. And the easiest way to find out what your broadband speed is, is go to a website called speedtest.net. When that thing loads up, you'll see a big geo in the center of the screen. And you click that, and it's going to sit there and make little lines going across the screen for a while until in about 30 seconds, it tells you what your upload speed is and your download speed for the connection that you have available to you. Let me, now this is, and that is measured in megabits per second. A standard one, you gotta have at least one megabit up and one megabit down for it to, for it to work for you. And I'm, when I say work for you, it barely functions at that. And some of the other fellows on the, on the call tonight will be able to attest. Uh, you need to have for a, a intermediate or a standard high definition as it's called, you need 2.6 megabit up and 1.8 down. And the truth of the matter is that's on the ragged edge of not enough. And what's really a joke, is this, and by the way, these, these uh, are off the website, the Zoom website, High definition, they say you need 3.8 up and three down. And I tell you what, I have trouble at times with my high definition. I got 70 coming down and nine going up, and I still have some struggles with it. I'm envious of Jack Gillis because he has a fiber optic connection that's about a million both directions. So if I can ever get fiber in this area, but you know, those of us here in Boise, we still have to ride horses to town to get our mail. So fiber optic probably isn't in the uh, cards for a while. I'm joking, by the way, I'm joking, okay? But if you have a problem with your internet, but it's pretty close to being okay, there are some things you can do to be able to put on a presentation, but you're gonna probably tick off the rest of the family. Set that aside. That first item right there, if you uh, have people trying to run streaming television, they're watching programs on, on YouTube, uh, they're downloading files on their on their uh, on the internet onto their computer. All that's got to stop so that you can run your Zoom. If you turn all those items off, it might help. In fact, it does quite often. The other thing that can make it work really well, and don't tell your family this, but if you make a hardwire connection between your computer and your router, 
with a category five, six, seven, or eight cable, or they're called ethernet cables as well. If you do that, what that does is bypass everybody else using the internet in your house and you've got it. So they'll be sitting there wondering why they see a, a little circle going around and around and around on their screen. It's because you've got the stuff already. So if they might as well turn it off and read a book. Okay, there are some other things that you can do. If you're having trouble, you can ask the Zoom participants to turn their video feeds off. Not off, but you know how you put a, a red line through the camera and it changes the screen usually to either a picture you've up uploaded or to a, a black screen. And the other thing is, and you wanna do this anyway, so you don't get a lot of, of um, interference, is to have them turn their audio feed off. Those will help. The best solution, solution is to invest in a better broadband connection. And that's what I had to do. And, and in order to get a better broadband connection to work in my house, I had to rewire the house uh, because it didn't have enough wires to, to support the broadband coming into the, into the router. So anyway, it, it's not always a, a real easy thing. Anyway, moving on to the next item. <clears throat> Zoom video and audio off. How do you do that? Well, if you don't know, and I, and, and I think most of you have been on Zoom enough to know that there's a Zoom screen. You can see down here, let me get in, let me get my annotate tool out. You can see down here that I've got a red line through the camera and it just shows Gretchen's in my picture. There's no video feed there. The other thing is, is that little carrot right there. If you don't know what that's for, is that brings up, let me get rid of these two drawings. It brings up this little drop up menu, I guess you'd call it, because it pops up rather than going down. And it's where you select the cameras that you're going to be using. It also, at the very bottom here, an important one is this, your video settings. And that's where you'll make changes there. I'm not gonna try to tell you how to make changes and all that type of stuff. That's for further down the road, but that's where you can check out uh, those items. Now let's move on to the next. Oh, wait a minute, I gotta turn off. I gotta turn off annotate. You don't like that. You won't use a pencil to move. Okay, here's, a, here's that second one. And this is for the audio. Again, I'll grab my pencil. And you can see that that's what we're talking about. That's the audio. And right now it's turned on. The same thing, the arrow right here, the, the little up arrow will net you the, this, this um, drop up menu, if you will, right here. It's where you select your microphone and your speaker. But I want you to notice another thing that you want to do every time you sign on, before you, uh, even before you come into a, a meeting, test your speaker and your microphone. You click that and you'll, you'll get a, a test on the microphone. And then it said, do you hear this? And it goes, makes some funny sounds and you click yes. And then you say testing one, two, three or whatever words you want to use. And you'll end up checking both. And then you say you're done and you move on. Is your laptop up to the task? Well, they tell us that you need to have versions of Windows 7, 8, 10 and 11. Actually, the Zoom thing says you got to have 10 and 11. That's not true. I've been doing uh, Zoom with 7 and 8 all along with no problem. But you must have a laptop with a built-in camera. And I, I didn't realize, I thought they all had cameras. And a friend of mine said, well, no, mine doesn't have one. Of course, he has, I think it's Windows 98 on it or something like that. It's a really old machine. But anyhow. <clears throat> uh, and if when you run additional cameras, we're not going to be doing that tonight. But when you run additional cameras, one camera per USB port. So where do we go from here? And quite frankly, I want to talk about something. I'm going to I'll get it out here and I'll have it when we come out of the PowerPoint. But we're at page six on the online presentation that Jerry Coviello prepared for the fly tying or excuse me, for Fly Fishers International uh, for the learning library. It's a really great document. But from page six, he goes on into more complex stuff. And we're going to stay at page six tonight learning how to get some of the things out of the way that, as an example, learning to work with um, 
automatic focus rather than have it work against us and vice versa. So we're going to be using a laptop for our presentation. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, Zoom presentation problems. The camera doesn't focus on the fly. Well, I kind of showed that to you just a little bit ago. The fly is too small. The audience can't see the details. It's too dark. It's too light. You can't identify colors. Adding more or less lighting doesn't help. What do we do to fix the problem? Well, this is where we're going to learn about understanding cameras and how they work. This is the only technical stuff I'm going to get into with you. All cameras, I don't care whether it's the most exotic color camera or it's one from the 30s, if they have a light meter in them, that meter works off of an 18% grayscale. And that's it. So when, when you, we'll talk about what that really means to us here in a moment, but that's 18% grayscale is how it meters and how it determines exposure. So that means we're gonna be talking about the background. The background is going to give us two things and I kind of alluded to it a little bit ago. The color of the background based on the 18% grayscale. And just because a color is green or a background is green or it's gray or it's purple or whatever, it could be any color as long as its tone is pretty much equal to 18% gray. Now, I know that sounds confusing as heck, but bottom line is the exposure out of the colored backgrounds I have are the same as out of the 18% grayscale. The thing that we need to know about, the other thing about our background is you cannot have a background with texture. There's only one way to get one without texture that I found in it. And I've been at this uh, for a while, long before I did Zoom. And that is, uh, it's called foam core. You get it at Hobby Lobby and Ben Franklin and these craft stores. And I got down here in my slide that it says two foot by three foot. I should have measured before I said that. It's actually 20 inches by 30 inches. But anyway, that's the size of the foam core when it comes to you. And you pick a color using a fly pattern and a cell phone. So the way I got my foam cores that I have here for tonight's presentation, well, actually, it's here because I use it for a lot of presentations, is I went to Hobby Lobby with a cell phone and a fly. And we use the cell phone to take a picture of the fly against the background. And what does it tell us? tells us whether we have a good or bad background. Non-texture, we'll get into the non-texture part here in just a minute. And the iron blue wingless is going to be the fly tonight. So what I'm going to do now is just get out of this. I'm going to escape, turn that off. Jim Ferguson, do you have a picture of me now instead of the slideshow? Yes. Hey, John Wright, the training this afternoon was a success. I, I managed to do it right for a change. Yay. Hey, hey, and Jack Gillis, quit laughing at me because I never used PowerPoint in all my years in corporate America. There was these cute little things. My secretary would make me these slides with a, out of a piece of clear plastic, and I'd put it on this thing called an overhead projector. And that was my PowerPoint for years while I was in the corporate corporate America. But anyway, before we go on, this right here, I sent all of you a link to this. It's an advanced copy of Jerry Coviello's book, How to Prepare for an Online Presentation. And tonight we're up to page six. Page six I'll go to just to show you. They go on to some stuff after page six. In fact, there's all the stuff right there about the internet speed and all that stuff. And then he goes into lighting and cameras and connections. Well, we're gonna stay right here with the computer. By the way, I wanted you to see, that's an 18% gray card. We'll uh, put that over here to show you how the uh, gray cards work here in just a minute. <clears throat> okay. Now, one of the things that I wanted to, to point out to you is, first off, we're going to talk about exposure and the 18% gray in relation to different colors. And I'm going to switch now to my vice camera. And there we are against a background that I already know is uh, as close to 18% gray as I can get and still have it be color. Well, what if 
I take that away and I'll take a, a gray one that I've got. Doesn't change a thing, does it? Well, shoot, what if I decide to have a fly tying demonstration using this setup and I'm gonna use my white t-shirt as a background. I wonder what'll happen. Well, let's take a look. Well, uh, the colors don't look quite the same. They're not real bad, but they don't look quite the same. So what does it look like when they get up closer? Oh, the lights are really making that white look white instead of gray. Washes those colors out something terrible, doesn't it? Okay, well, let's um, take this foam core and turn it back around because I had this grand thing that I thought that I wanted them all to be on a black background. And God, I loved the looks of that black background when I was shooting still pictures for magazine articles and stuff like that. So let me get over and see what happens if I try to use a black background. I'll get over to uh, another camera. And I just laid this uh, black background down. And let me get this fly that's in the vise right now. And let's just put it right there. And huh, it sure doesn't show the colors very good, does it? So the, the summation to this little experiment is that you take, let me get back here to me. I got this. I go into a Hobby Lobby and let's pretend that this is the 20 inch by 30 inch, one of these guys, great big guys of foam. And you just take your cell phone out and you hold the fly up against the thing and you take a picture. And if it comes out, look, and if it looks like that, great. If it looks like the one with black or the one with white, you probably got the wrong color. And that's all you got to do to pick the proper, the proper color for exposure. Now, I've had several people that I go through this process with of picking a no uh, a background with no um, texture. Like this thing right here. This is, this is a foam core, and you can see it's just slick and smooth as can be. No texture whatsoever. There's another one in Hobby Lobby right next to it. There's a bin of this stuff, and then there's a bin right next to it. It looks very similar, but they kind of have a little, they look kind of corrugated almost. They're, they got a rough finish, matte finish. That's what I'm looking for. And that matte has got just enough texture in it that it will cause your camera to focus on the background rather than on the fly. And that's what we're gonna be working with here in a minute. Let's see, now where am I at on my presentation? Because I think we're just about to the point of talking about, okay, I gotta, hey guys, what I'm trying to do here is, just so you can see, we're using that guy right there, the computer. And if I turn over to the computer and I say, we're using that guy right there, well, what are you looking at? I mean, well, I can put my finger on the camera, but that doesn't do any good. I mean, so tonight, from this point on, I'm going to show you a few of the things that we would normally do with a um, fly tying demonstration using all the cameras I got in the Zoom studio. And then when I go to the go to the fly tying, it is going to be strictly with this right here. But for right now, let me go and get a Wait, wait a minute, which camera? Oh, I gotta go to this camera. Okay, good. Now let's get back over to the materials camera. Let me get that black out of the way. These are the materials that we're gonna use. And I'm gonna give you a chance to see these materials. Why? Because I gotta drag a chair over here, take all those materials and move them over by, by, my, uh, by my laptop so I can reach them because Gretchen's not here to hand them to me. Now, chuckle away there, guys, but that's just the way it is. Anyway, this is Grizzly. You'll be seeing what we're going to use that for here in a minute. And I've already got a couple of Grizzly feathers picked out. And as you can see there, I got them in a little clip just to help me out there. Now, we're going to go over these same materials when we're doing the actual presentation uh, with the laptop. Okay, that was a dubbing in the, in the, in the dubbing wax thread hooks, package of hooks, put all that on the chair so I can push it back over here and let's get 
Come back. Let's go. Let's go to the wide shot camera. Okay. Now this right here, this moving chair is my materials. As you can see, I've got my, my grizzly cape there laying on that chair so I can have that laying right here beside me, but I'm using that guy right there for my presentation. But before we go into the presentation, now all these things that I normally use are gone. I'm making a presentation to all of you and I'm using a laptop. Well, I, first thing I got to do is talk about the materials. Well, we did that. We can, uh, we're going to be using a Grizzly Hackle tonight. We can hold that up. You can see that I've already got a couple selected. Good. Put that aside. We've got dubbing and dubbing wax, okay, hooks. And I've already got the hooks in a clip. So I hope, hopefully I don't drop them both. And I've got thread. And I'm just gonna set the thread right down here beside the mouse because it's gonna come into use here in just a moment. You'll get that cell phone out of the way. I don't need it for the moment. Okay, so now that's one way to show the materials. And in, in the only way I found that's worth a darn. Now we're coming into showing the recipe. Okay, well, you can do this. You can take a three by five card and run it through the printer on your computer. And there's the fly that we're tying tonight. The iron blue wingless. You can see the hooks we got. Thread, hackle, tail, body, rib, head. Pretty straightforward. You're gonna find this a really, really simple fly. It also is one straight out of my personal fly box. Now there's another way to show the recipe if you're really a neophyte, this is one way that you can stay in the, in the uh, 1800s or the 1900s and show a recipe. And it works just fine. You know, and it, it, no, there's nothing wrong with it. That said, there's another way to do it, and that's with, with a screen share. What's going on here? Well... We're going to be having a tough time tonight if I, if I can't get my computer to quit doing what it's doing. Let's try that. Okay, let's try coming back. Well, for some reason, my, my computer is messing up, but it's not so bad we can't demonstrate with it. So we're going to, we're going to soldier on, folks. The other way to, to do the recipe is via screen share recipe. Here we go. Iron blue wingless. Another way to do it. You guys can do it the same darn way. Put a black background in or put a white background in, whatever you want to do. It's up to you. And I sure wish I knew why that darn thing was doing that. But anyway, at this point, we've shown you two recipes and two ways of doing it. The, uh, the card and um, the screen share. And there's probably other ways to do it too, but those are the only two that I figured out. Now we're gonna move into setting up the computer so that we can do a demonstration with it. <clears throat> Let me go to the wide shot. We're over here, we're looking down here. We're gonna start out with, let me set this out of the way. This right here is a piece of neoprene, three thirty seconds thick. The thickness don't make any difference. It's just the only reason we have the neoprene is so I can lay that right over the mouse pad. Because when I put the next thing on the mouse pad, my vise, uh, the mouse don't like it when you set a metal pedestal on top of the, the pad, the mouse pad. I don't know what the heck's wrong with it, but, but that's the way they are. So let's get back here. And let me start bringing this down into the picture. Oh, good. But now we've got that same problem we had before. Remember that I talked to you about um, the background, focusing on it. Well, the fly shows up pretty good, but dang, I got a background it's causing me troubles. What am I going to do? Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get that background that I always use and bring it over here. And let's just show you what we're going to do. We're going to go to the wide shot. See, I got this big background from back there. I'm going to set that on my lap. 
so that now when we go back, that's what we're looking at. And now we want it to focus. Looks like it's pretty much in focus. I'll pull it a little bit closer. And to tie flies, I have to move back a little bit because otherwise I've only got about one finger's worth of space right here. So there's our roadmap fly. The iron blue wingless. Now I'm going to start by taking this out of the vise. Set that down right there. Let me get one of my hooks out here. Thankfully, I had the hooks already in the clip. Now I'm going to get my thread out. And I want you to notice that I've got thread in, uh, in the, uh, the, the uh, bobbin. And I've got this rubber grommet right here. And what that does is keeps my thread from coming, uh, from coming out of the barrel. I can't tell you how many shows I travel to. And I'd get there and all the bobbins would be unthreaded. There's something about getting on a plane that causes that. I don't know what it is, but OK. And I'll grab the scissors. By the way, we're using whisk scissors tonight. Get those up there so you can see what we're talking about. Trim off the waist. And um, I still got the wrong glasses, so I'll temporarily you're going to see something else while I go get another pair of glasses. Because I, I, I'll tell you, I have tied about uh, six flies in my life using the method that we're talking about. Because why would I want to do this when I've got a full Zoom studio? I mean, come on, guys. Okay. There we go. <clears throat> now we're going to have to bring a feather into the process. And we're going to use uh, one of these that we already have selected. Okay, I'll just set that guy aside right there. I think we'll use this feather right here. Looks like it's a pretty good size. And what I'm going to do now is just strip off them, get down here where the where the stem is fairly thick, and I'm going to strip the fibers off right about right about there throw them over there in the trash bin. So that gives us a prepared, prepared stem. And we'll just go ahead and tie that on. And it's really important that we get that right on top of the hook. Well, if you put the stem on top of the hook, the fibers will start, st start sticking out down on the side. So what you want is the fibers to be on top of the hook. That means that the stem is gonna be down on the side. And I'm gonna wrap back a short distance. And what I'm doing is by doing this is I'm uh, binding the stem to the first part of the body and it's gonna add just a little bit of bulk to that body. So that it is, it's a little bit bulkier up here in the front than it is here towards the back. Now I'm going to advance my thread forward and start wrapping my hackle back. See, I, I moved the thread back behind and now I'm going to start wrapping my hackle each turn after the previous. I'm going to do three turns, which I never do on my personal flies, but it shows up better on camera. So right there, three turns back, anchored the feather on top. So the fibers start on top and the end on top where I tied this off. Now you don't cut the feather off. What we're going to do now is we're going to wrap towards the back of the fly. Until we get uh, part of the way down the shank. And what we want to do now is to. OK, good. Now, what I'm going to do is bend these this feather back and you can see the waist fibers there. They're kind of sticking back. They're going to be my tail. And what I need to do is wrap just a little bit further back so that I can get a tail that's long enough. And that's going to be a tail about the length that I want, so I'll just break off the rest, and the remaining fibers will be my tail.
No, I'm just building up right there, and I need to put add some dubbing now to the mix and some dubbing wax. <clears throat> now this is one place where the only way that I can make this happen to put dubbing and not end up with wax and dubbing all over my uh, screen of my computer is to move this back just a little bit so that I can, I've got room to work in there without causing a mess. Okay, and we'll get the get our dubbing out. And this happens to be some of our soft touch dubbing. I'll just pull the fibers out. And we'll just put the let the wax thread pull as grab as much dubbing as it can handle. And there we go. We'll start wrapping now forward, working our way to the front of the fly, dubbing in the body. Notice that I left a little bit of a tag back there, and that was on purpose. All right, here we go. Now I'm going to wiggle wrap through the turns of hackle until I get to the area in front and I'm gonna pull those fibers back. And let's get here just a little closer now so you can see what we're doing. Now get the nice thread head build in there. I'll get my clip finish tool. Might have it finish. Put my thread aside. And let's take a quick look at the fly. You can see it's a pretty easy to tie sort of a fly. And now what we're going to do is we're going to move back and chat. And you don't see the fly anymore. Well, that brings us to the point where I asked Jim to remind me of something, and that is a option two or plan two. Let me get another pair of glasses out here because those glasses, I can't even see the screen. They got so much magnification. There you guys are. I can find you all again. Okay. The fly we just tied is right there. What if Fred was holding a class and I was one of his students? And I was just busy tying away here. And he said, Al, would you stop a minute? Let's check your progress. Oh, it's focused on your shirt, Al. Could you change that? So I have a small piece of foam core that I take with me so that Fred can check my work. Okay, Fred, that looks pretty good. So plan two is this is a way for instructors to get feedback from their students without having to have a whole bunch of equipment installed at the student's house. They got a laptop. They have to have a laptop or some kind of computer to be talking to you on Zoom. So the screen is right there. Fred is teaching me. That screen turns to his fly and he's demonstrating and I'm tying along. Like, Wait a minute, Fred, you're going too fast. You tie a little bit more. So I think the real value of this setup it's a pain in the butt, quite frankly, folks. I'll tell you right up front to demonstrate with it. But if you want to do demonstrate with it, please be my guest. But if you want to use it for the plan B, it is an awesome tool for, for that purpose, to give feedback from the student to the instructor and vice versa. The last thing I wanted to, I said, remind me of this. This is a piece of foam core with a hackle pliers on it and a popsicle stick. Another way I see this all the time. Let me let me grab. Uh, well, here's the here's the fly that we we took out, and they say, "Would you show me your fly?" And they, well, well, hey, 
what you want to do is when you buy your foam core, cut a little piece off because you don't need the whole thing. Put it in there and then let your, your folks see the fly that way. Real easy to do. Even I can do it. So, so that isn't much of, a much of a demonstration tonight, but it gives you an idea what you can do with your computer. And don't do what Fred did. Don't glue your stuff in the vise. Glue it later after it's away from the computer. <clears throat> or a, or if you if you want your wife to allow if you want to tell your wife you got to have a new computer then you could have an accident. No, Al, so. Al, I do I do have a question. The um, <clears throat> I have difficulty at times with lighting, and um, I find that if I, I use Direct lighting on onto the fly, it washes it out. Yep. Um, what are your suggestions? Um, <clears throat> depends on on the lighting that you're using. Okay, um, I will go to this. Let me set this stuff out of my way for a minute, Fred. I'm getting too much stuff left over from the demonstration, and I'm going to have a mess here. And what I don't want to do is I'll tell you a, a story on myself and it's a, a really bad one. One of the things that I used to do at shows all the time is let's pretend that this is a bodkin. And I would put glue because I was still gluing things at that time. And I'd put glue on my fly and then I would take and stab it into the chair between my legs to clean it off. I'd <laughs> thousands and thousands of flies that way. And then I end up at this show in, well, I won't tell you where, it doesn't make any difference. It was embarrassing enough what happened but anyway so i went and stabbed it into the chair it was a metal folding chair and it bounced and you mad, can imagine where it went <laughs> yes. enough said i won't say any more but it was a tough day let me tell you what folks a real tough day so when i when i tell you that i've had experiences in tying flies and i and i give you some caution on things not to do that's one not to do believe me i don't care whether you're male or female it won't end good so anyway let me set this aside Al, yes. You said that you, when you put three wraps on that fly, you said something to the effect you don't usually do that. Three. The front hackle. Oh, three wraps. <laughs> Normally, that that fly, uh, I I do it with two wraps, and that's just I think perfect in the, shall we say, uh, I like it to be have a very slender profile. And um, I can't think of the word right now, but anyway, sparse. <laughs> sparse. Thank you, Jim. Looking for that word, sparse. And and um, I want the hackle to be sparse. And so I put three on because it shows up better on camera. But the truth of the matter is, the ones that go to the river with me got two. Sometimes and what even, size do you usually make them? I always make mine the size that takes all the salmon fly tires and makes them cringe because it's way too long. But I'm going fishing. And I have mine so the the barbs, the, the the hackle usually reaches back, as you can see here, uh, right about to the end of the of the hook. That's basically a soft hackle. Yeah, exactly. It's, a, it's, it's just another way of tying a soft hackle. <clears throat> Put that over there. It's a way of tying a soft hackle. <clears throat> Uh, tying it backwards and make and using the tail out, make the tail out of the waist. Thank we, you. I love that. Yeah, That's we also do a whole series of dry flies that way. And I didn't dream this up. I, I'll tell you the story. You probably have heard it a thousand times already. But anyway, back in the day, Gretchen and I ran a, ran a, got an opportunity to buy a fly factory out in Malaysia, and we did. We bought it. Uh, we we bought everything that they had by the kilo, which is two point two pounds. And we got, I think it was 20 kilos of stuff. And basically it was dirt, sweepings on the floor, tags of thread, bare hooks, and a little over a thousand dozen flies. And we got it for a really good price. As an example, there was, um, I think, uh, 60 dozen size 24 blue wing dollies. I mean, and they were exquisitely tied. Just, mm. but anyway, one of the things that I got to look at some of the flies and I said, Jesus Christian, I wonder, I wonder how they got these to always turn out perfect. And they had 
the blue winged the blue wings and the blue winged olives we took one apart and it wasn't hackle point wings it was the end of the hackle and what they had done is tied two hackles on wrapped three turns around one back through and tie, tied the thread in the middle and they had measured them to the point where three turns of, four turns of hackle and the the end of the hackles were the wings i said holy oh, darn gosh. so then i started saying well with that idea in mind you know I started thinking of other things and we started doing everything backwards for about a year. We tied all of our own flies backwards, dreaming of all the different things that we could do. And one of the things that you end up with, and I think about this very carefully, you wrap the hackle back. Then you come forward through that hackle with the thread. You were binding down every turn of that hackle. You make bulletproof flies by wrapping, rever tying reverse like that. They are bulletproof. It don't make any, any difference if they're dries or wets. They are bulletproof because it is just super double double anchored. <clears throat> but anyway. <clears throat> so I have a question. This particular uh, viewing did not seem as sharp as the very beginning of the show when you showed that multicolored fly. Is that because you were on a different camera than the computer camera for that? Oh, yeah. Okay. I was on that guy right there. Okay, very good. That's and, why. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll put my regular background back. That, this is, I mean, there is no way, there is absolutely no way that you will get the same quality of picture out of a webcam that you will out of a digital camera. Okay, absolutely. that explains it. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't happen, but it doesn't mean that it wasn't sharp enough that you couldn't get the detail and be able to go to your vice and... And, and go from there to learn to learn the process you know the backwards hackle i mean it don't make any difference if it's slightly blurry or not focused doesn't look quite as good as off a digital slr you still get the same uh, the same lesson if you will mm. i have a dumb question okay can you define webcam yeah it's uh something that don't look real good <laughs> I, I do the okay a webcam okay that's one right there the that's one that's in your computer the one that's in your computer there's a let me get another one out well what's what's this guy wait a minute oh well i can't <laughs> what's this one that sits on my computer and i can and it's got a wire and it hooks on you, you, you yeah mean, okay you mean, you mean one like this yeah that's also a webcam that's a webcam too okay and here's another webcam Let's see, um, get this guy, oh, here we go. Now this is a webcam and in fact, it, it, it's sold under two different things, but it's uh, actually a surveillance camera slash webcam. And that is a super sharp camera, um, but it's a very shallow depth of field. I mean, it, it's fine, but it's, um, well, it's, it's not being used, it's in the drawer. It's there yeah. for a reason. <clears throat> So when yeah, you say digital camera, is that just, what is it, what do you mean by a digital, like a digital video camera that you can connect to your computer? Is that what you're oh, on it's, now? It's an Icon digital SLR, high-end one right there. It's a digital SLR, or let's okay. go to this right here. You can see right, right back oh, there. Okay. It's just a regular digital camera on a tripod that's, that I'm using. Okay. And, um, it's kind of overkill, but it also it does the job. Now, I was in the middle of answering an, something for Fred on lighting, and I got waylaid. So let me get back to that. All right. Would you, would you re-ask the question, Fred? Well, I um, have, from time to time, have trouble uh, with lighting in that if I use direct lighting, it washes out the image. Right. Okay. Yes. And, and that is, that is very true. What I have here on this fly right there, I have uh, one, well, let's go back to the wide shot. I've got one light obviously from here coming from up above. I have another one from back here coming in from the back at an angle. And I've got two coming in from down below coming up at it. And all of them are set so that they're not directly on the fly, with the exception of my tying light, which is up here. 
Okay. I, al I also have another dozen around the room lighting the whole room through bounce lighting because I got them all set to bounce off of the different walls and stuff. I'm sorry, Fred, you were going to ask something. No, that was it. So, uh, Do some of those lights shine in your eyes? Like the, only the ones that come up? A problem with, the only time you have a problem with the lights shining in your eyes is when you elect to have the camera on the other side of the device pointing at you as it would be as a person viewing from across the table uh, at a show, you know, because they're looking across the table at you. Yeah, okay. And when you do that, the proper way to light the fly is from the camera's direction. And that means that those lights are coming at you. So what you have to do is you got to move them off to the side enough so that they're not shining in your eyes. But yeah, it's a real pain. Now yeah. I want to show you the difference in lighting. We will get into this probably in the third week, but being to ask the lighting question, we'll do it right now. <clears throat> Let me make a couple of adjustments here. Okay. Right there, it still looks pretty good, though I've only got one light overhead, and that is the, the tying light. And there are a lot of people try to do fly tying demonstrations with a tying light, and there's no lights coming in from below. And when you get ready to demonstrate of something you're going to do on the fly, I want you to notice that I move my hand into the frame and it shadows the body. Whenever you do anything, it shadows it out because it's not being lit. But what I, now I'll turn on the two lights from below. And remember, they're bouncing in. They're not coming directly in. And now when I reach in with my hand, you can see what I'm doing. And so it's really important to get lighting from above and below for your fly tying demonstration. And Fred will tell you a lot more about that when we get into his on the third week. And, and I'll talk more about it when we get into mine uh, next week, because we'll be working from that direction with us with a cell phone as our main camera. Al, but, yes. One of the things that I have found if uh, you want to, if you're going to be using a webcam, buy one that's a manual focus. Yeah, that Fred's going to talk at length about that. Oh, and good. All the pitfalls that you run into with the automatic focus, cross over to the webcam and you can make that automatic focus work for you. But Fred's got a great system for making the manual, inexpensive manual one do a really great job for you. So he'll be, he'll be talking about that. Any other questions or comments or whatever? Now, one of the things we also learned was we like to use white thread when we're tying because it makes the thread a little more visible to the camera. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing you notice that where I'm using uh, a green background, the reason I don't use my gray background very much is because an awful lot of the materials that you use on a fly fall into that uh, muted color of a gray, uh, a darkish tan, uh, like that. And I'll tell you what, what you'll find also when you start doing Zoom presentations, if you have colors that match your background, they have a way of disappearing. So one of the things that I don't do on my flies very often is use a bright green that is about the same color as the background, just simply because uh, it will disappear. And it's a lot easier to narrate to your audience saying, um, this fly is usually tied with the lime green, but tonight we're using red because it contrasts better with the background. And they'll understand. They're there to learn how to tie the fly, not whether you use red thread or whether you use green thread. They can get their own thread and make their selection accordingly. Or when you pick a fly for demonstration purposes, pick one that's got a, a color in the darn thing that's going to work with your background rather than against it. As an example, I would not do a California coachman with this background because it's got green in the body, I do a Royal Coachman. Well, same fly, same technique, same everything, different colors. I'll have a comment, please. Please. Um, to prepare for the online demonstration. Yes. Let you, me, can, let me. you can go to zoom.us and on that screen, you'll see in the banner at the top, one of the choices says host. If you click on host, 
you have several choices and then you click on with video on that opens a zoom session by yourself for yourself yep. and you can get into zoom by yourself and you can set up your cameras set up your lights set up your focus switch flies back and forth while you're looking at your own monitor and see exactly what your students would would be seeing and you can practice all these things in particular the lighting uh, to get everything with the right focus and so forth and get all that in place before you actually have a session but you're doing that by yourself and then you you end the session with yourself and you're all ready to go sure that is an absolutely great suggestion go through that process one more time slowly for those of you that that's us that didn't realize what a great tip that was well there, you're, you're covering so many great points now about cameras and angles and lighting and so forth if you're preparing to host an online demonstration uh, go to your search engine and type in zoom dot us that'll take you to a screen and at the top on the banner you'll see some choices one that says join one says host one says sign in if you click on host the drop down menu allows you to click on with video on that takes you immediately into a zoom session with yourself and while you're in there you can access the, the, the carrots and, the, and the, the points you showed earlier out at the bottom for audio and video. And you can practice switching back and forth with cameras. You can practice, you can see how the focus can change. Uh, one thing that, that is also important to realize is that when you set up a demonstration like this, it's very likely the vice will not be at the same distance from you as you're accustomed to if you're just tying on your own Boy, isn't that and true? with that with the device being further away it can actually cause things for you the, the the light looks good on the fly itself but it can appear darker since you're sitting further back correct you may not see your thread as well and so forth but in any case you can move your lighting around you can switch cameras you can actually tie a fly and watch yourself dress that fly on your own monitor and what you're seeing is exactly what your students would see. Mm -hmm. So you can practice those techniques until you get to a point where you feel like the students would be seeing an optimal demonstration. You know, normally at a time like this is when I would stop the live feed to Facebook and to YouTube that where this other recording is going to end up. I'm going to keep it up there because the suggestions like that and the question from Fred and who, who knows what's going to come up. We don't want to lose that because that's valuable information that you've shared with us going to zoom.us. I do the same thing by setting up, um, well, you, you, you sign in as a one person and you can do that too. But I didn't realize you can do it through the Zoom site. And I'll bet you it's a better setup than, than the way I was doing it. Because I had Real to record simple. it and look back at the recording. Thank you. That's a good one, Dutch. Thank you. Al, have you gone to your share screen to see if that's what's causing the uh, the the uh, addresses and names on your screen? On my screen? Yeah, you know, like we're looking still with Gretchen and Al Beatty at the bottom, and and then your your website at the top. You're, you're saying uh, you're talking about those at the top of the bottom? Yeah. Yeah, and but it's a full picture of me, but it's uh, Beatty's fly fishing and all that stuff. Yeah, I put that on there on purpose. Okay, that's uh, one of the reasons we offer all kinds of free stuff to you guys, but you're going to have to listen to or watch some some uh, advertising. And and that's that's fine. Little <laughs> advertising there, and um, and also all well, beans that you mentioned, it, Jim. Thank you for the lead in. We're going to talk <laughs> about books. We have books for sale, and you know what? They're on that website back there, so you can go back to that website and you can buy books if you want to. Okay, enough of the commercial. Now we're back to what we were, we were doing. <laughs> and the uh, questions are, I'm sorry. Well, you know, Fred was talking about lighting and I went to Staples and I got this light 
Uh, I don't know. It's, it's just like, right like a fluorescent, huh. but it's got it's got the on off button on it, yeah. but it's also got three different settings for brightness, and it also has a setting for different types of lighting. You've got normal light, you've got one that's kind of more or less just white light, and you've got one like which would be daylight outside with the sun. So you've got different shades there, and it's high enough above the sun. I don't have to worry about it. Sometimes these are, um, you know, this, these spotlights you Excellent, excellent piece of information there. You get them there. You also get them. I've got about six of them here that have that same type of adjustment. They're all LCD USB driven lights. You plug them into a USB uh, port or you plug them into one of those little AC adapters that, that works on, on USB and, and that works too. And, and then you've got three or four different levels of light and colors and so forth. So yeah, that's very nice. They're very good. Now that light you have coming from below, what do you have? You said you 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 have it so it's going in directly to towards oh, the fly rather than I direct. didn't I didn't show that tonight, but let's go back to that so that we can. Okay, let me highlight this real quick. Spotlight. <clears throat> back in the day when I learned photography, um, I learned photography in the military, and we, and we shot a lot of portraits, if you will. Well, let's turn off these bottom two here. And you've seen how that changes and you already know about my hand moving into it. But the other thing that I have here is I have a light coming in from the back at an angle right up in this area here. It's what it's hitting. It's called a hair light. And, mm. it's, and it's the mm. same thing that if you watch the guy on the news in the evening, in fact, let me turn this off. That's the light that we're getting just from the hair light. And when you watch the evening news and your news reader is reading the news to you, take a good look. You'll see that probably usually the left side coming in from the back, the back side of the head and the shoulder. And what the only purpose for this is to provide definition between the background and the and the subject, which could be a person, a fly, or whatever. It, uh, anyway, good. Okay, now, what what about the setup down below? That's what I was wondering. What type of lights you have there? The lights that you were talking about, Jim. I have clamp-on types that do the same thing that you talk about. There are three levels of light and four different colors for each one. I think. Okay. And I put tape over the ones that changes the colors because. I want to just turn these things on, have them go on, and be the same that I had from the time before, so I'm not constantly having to, to change stuff. So, yeah. Anyway, okay. does so, it make any difference if they're LED or fluorescent or? The only thing that's uh, really really nice, I like the LEDs because they don't get hot. Mm -hmm. and for years and years, I my my studio okay. was these 400 watt um, light bulbs. Geez, they got hot. Yeah. <laughs> And if you you could burn yourself if you bumped into them, and uh, if you were working under the heat of the lights, the heat of the lights was uh, was a real thing. Yeah. Okay. So now these, Al, do you plan on going into OBS studios at all in this presentation anytime? I had not planned on it, but it depends on you know we're going to get up through Fred's third session, and if it looks like we have interest, I might go further. But you know. I'm in the process of redoing my complete Zoom studio. I'm going to add four more cameras. I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff. And not everybody wants to put several thousand dollars into a Zoom studio that I'm doing because I'm having a good time doing it, you know? Thank you. Okay. So I'd like them to be able to demonstrate at the FFI show in November, or at least be qualified enough with our, my help and Fred's help that they could do that. And then if they want to set up a couple thousand dollars Zoom studio, they can do that. And uh, whether I'm going to get into that or not, I I haven't decided yet unless it, unless it looks like there's enough interest. Otherwise, I'll, yeah. you know, like, as an example, David Buckner, a good friend of mine, has already expressed interest, and he and I will be working on some things 
off away from everything instead of a part of a group. It'll just be working on with him together and I'll work with some individuals too. So. So our fly fishing club has a really good di digital video camera. And we tried to do this by just projecting onto a screen mm -hmm. through a projector. And it was great except for one little foo paw. And that is that it would, the camera would not sit there and look at the fly without some movement or otherwise it would shut down. It had it had, uh, had automatic shutdown. We could never figure out how to overdo that or overcome it. So there's um there's a website that tells you which cameras will have that and don't have it. In fact, today I'm I was working on downloading some software for one of my older Nikon's because it shuts off after I forget what it is. Fif let's say fifteen minutes. Thanks to the G. Huh? Fifteen. I think it's fifteen minutes. It shuts off and. So I'm I'm downloading a software hack that I'm going to install into the software of the camera to bypass that so that I can have the unlimited live view. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be fighting that. Some of the, some cameras you just can't fix it. I got another camera that I see that I can buy um, a a cord that plugs into the accessories um, jack, and then I got that cord and twist a couple of wires together and it'll bypass it. So I got another old camera that I'm going to put to work uh, and, and, and be able to do um, unlimited live view by doing a hack of plugging in some wires and twisting them together. I mean, yeah. so I'll the, try anything if, if it's not too expensive of a camera. Sony had a, had a camera that uh, if it was on battery power, it would do what he was mentioning, it would shut off. But if you plugged it into the wall, you know, and had had the external power source plugged in, it would stay on. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a very common thing, too. And all of my cameras, I have, I got about 15 power sources around here that are pretty much <laughs> interchangeable with all of the cameras. Because well, I got another studio out in, another, in the other room that's strictly for magazine articles and books and that kind of stuff. And that one stays plugged in. It's another Nikon plugged in with a with a um, with a AC wall adapter device. A dummy, I think they're called dummy batteries. One of the one of the ways we could, I think, you can defeat our camera is to uh, put it on actual record, as opposed to just use the camera feature. Mm -hmm. If you put it on record, it'll record up to an hour. So huh. it forces you to record everything. Is the problem. And a lot of times you just want the camera for the camera, not for recording reasons. Sure. Yeah, that's um, just, uh, yeah. anyway, uh, there's this there's a there's a website. If anybody's interested, send me an email and I'll send you the link of a website of different cameras that are available that can be used for live streaming, meaning they have unlimited live streaming time. And if it's not on that list, there's a good chance that you're either going to have to come up with a hack to defeat that or there's nothing you can do it i've got a couple other nikons here that there's no way that i can use them for anything other than shooting pictures because there's no way that i found to hack around the software to get rid of that feature i'll just uh heads up for some people if they decide to go buy a handheld video camera make sure it has clean hd on my output oh I, thank you excellent point and that there's a bunch of these cameras that don't have clean HDMI and what is that? When you view a picture on the LCD on the back of your camera and it says shutter speed, uh, number of shots left to go, uh, ASA or not, not ISO and um, the f-stop and all that stuff and you can see that in the little white writing around the edge of the screen and that's handy when you're shooting pictures but you sure don't want it in your live stream and getting rid of that is called clean HDMI. When it's gone, it's clean. And when it's there, it's dirty. And some of them, you can't get rid of it. Al, can I make a plug? Uh, Absolutely. The, uh, the, uh, anyone that would like to tie at the FFI event on November 4th, 5th, and 6th, <laughs> if uh, uh, using Zoom after taking these classes, um, you, you can email me at F-L-Y-T-Y-E-R-F-R-E-D at gmail.com. It's flytirefred at gmail.com. 
and I'll send you an invitation. Hey, Paul, down in Australia, hint, hint, hint. Yeah, okay. Okay, come on. Yeah, uh, you, you I might got a question. Well. You of, got the some great... two, of the two webcams you showed, which one is the best? The two cheap um, webcams. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say one way or the other until Fred makes his presentation okay. because I may give you some information that I don't. Fred's got a really great thing coming up. So okay. wait until after the 1st of July. And uh, in his presentation, couldn't even change my mind on, on the webcam. So those are all over in the drawer now for a reason. <clears throat> okay. Can repeat the uh, email again? It's Fly, flytirefred at gmail.com. And tire is spelled T Y E R. <clears throat> I see a bunch okay. of people writing, Fred, so that's good. Maybe we'll get some. Also, uh, that's for a fly tying demonstration. If you want to do a workshop, um, Jack, do you want to give your information? Yeah, it's just Jack Gillis, G I L L I S, at Outlook.com. Difference that's between a demonstration and a workshop. Demonstration is just you know coming out and showing how to tie a fly. Workshop, we're looking for techniques uh, that you could show how to apply the quill wings, married wings, uh, material selections, those types of things. And say that email again. It was Jack Gillis at what? Outlook. Outlook. Okay, I didn't get that. Uh, Jack Gillis at Outlook.com. Well, thank you, Al. It's been great. Wonderful. Well, I as you all know, when I get through with these Friday nights, the next thing on my list is Midsummer Murders. So, guys, <laughs> we'll see you later. All Have right. a good one. And we'll be back next Bye -bye. week. Same time, same time, same station, different subject. Well, Very same good. subject, different, different method. Thanks so much. Thank you, Al. Great job. Bye-bye.